Welcome to the Global News Podcast, your source for the latest and most comprehensive coverage of global events, breaking news, and in-depth analysis. We are here to guide you through the top stories from around the world. Whether it's politics, economics, culture, or science. Hello, this is the Global News Podcast from the BBC World Service, with reports and analysis from across the world. The latest news, seven days a week. BBC World Service podcasts are supported by advertising. People Fixing the World is the podcast looking for solutions to the problems we face today. It could potentially ease the suffering of millions. We have a solution. Let's do it. People Fixing the World from the BBC World Service. This is the Global News Podcast from the BBC World Service. I'm Nick Bars, and in the early hours of Sunday, the 7th of April, these are our main stories. Tens of thousands of anti-government demonstrators have returned to the streets of Tel Aviv after the Israeli military recovered the body of a hostage from Gaza. The head of NATO says the West is facing an alliance of authoritarian powers comprised of Russia, China, Iran and North Korea. Nicaragua has become the latest Latin American country to cut ties with Ecuador in protest at the arrest of a politician who'd been sheltering in the Mexican embassy in Quito. Also in this podcast... A lot of them have come a long way. Australia, Japan, Peru, you name it. They're coming on a sort of homage to Holmes Chapel. They'll meet Simon if he's in, the owner of uh, the bakery. Thousands of fans of the British pop star Harry Styles have been flocking to a sleepy village in northern England to see where he grew up. We begin in Israel. Tens of thousands of Israelis took to the streets of Tel Aviv on Saturday to demand the government of the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu does a deal to secure the release of the some 130 Israeli hostages still being held by Hamas in Gaza. This man said it was time for Mr Netanyahu to go. I think it's a shame we still have Bibi Netanyahu as our Prime Minister. I think he should resign after what happened six months ago. The war start and uh, Hamas and everything. He claimed that he wants to go to a war and uh, make Hamas go away and bring all their hostages up home, back home. Unfortunately, he didn't achieve not the destruction of Hamas. We still have 133 hostages in, uh, in Gaza. I hope they're in Gaza. I hope they're alive. The protest comes after the body of Ilad Katsia, a 47-year-old farmer who was abducted from a kibbutz on October the 7th last year, was recovered by Israeli special forces in Khan Yunis in Gaza. I heard more from our correspondent in Jerusalem, Hugo Bashega. The sister of uh, this man whose body was found uh, has written a very angry post on, on, on Facebook, uh, essentially blaming the Israeli government for her brother's death. She says he could have been brought back alive if the government had negotiated a deal with Hamas. And I think this is a snapshot of the, you know, of, of how the relatives, the friends of the hostages feel uh, right now. Uh, they are very angry, especially with Prime Minister Netanyahu. I've interviewed several relatives and friends of hostages since those people were kidnapped uh, in October. And, and most of them have the same message. They believe that the government hasn't made uh, you know, the release of the hostages a priority. And many believe that the prime minister is only interested in his political survival and, and the families demand a deal. And the prime minister says that military pressure will force Hamas to negotiate. But the families say that this strategy hasn't really worked, that this only puts the hostages at risk. So there is a lot of pressure on the government to negotiate, but there is a lot of anger. People are really, you know, despaired because they believe that the government is not doing enough to guarantee the release of these hostages. And Sunday marks six months since those Hamas attacks in Israel. And there's a lot of pressure on the military strategy of Benjamin Netanyahu as well, isn't there? Exactly. And I think, uh, you know, patience was 
already running out with the Israelis and, and the way the Israeli military has been conducting this war against Hamas in Gaza. More than 33,000 Palestinians have been killed, according to the local authorities. There is a massive humanitarian crisis that only gets worse. And and then we had the attack on the aid convoy that, you know, has sparked widespread condemnation. Some countries talking about weapons bans to Israel. So the authorities are under a lot of pressure from, you know, some of the country's closest allies. And in particular, the United States, I think it was, you know, very significant. The phone call that happened between President Biden and Prime Minister Netanyahu, in which Essentially, President Biden said, if you don't change course, we're going to change our position. There is a lot of pressure now for a ceasefire to be negotiated. So we now know that Hamas is sending a delegation to Cairo on Sunday for talks for a ceasefire. The Egyptians and the Qataris have been acting as mediators. We understand that uh, the head of CIA is expected to join those talks in Cairo. Uh, And any kind of deal would see the release of hostages in return for Palestinians being held in Israeli jails and also a humanitarian pause that would allow more humanitarian aid to be delivered to Palestinians in Gaza. But these are very difficult negotiations and we still don't know whether, you know, uh, several of the obstacles that existed in these negotiations have been resolved. Hugo Bashega. Well, as we just heard, it is six months to the day since the October the 7th attacks carried out in southern Israel by Hamas, which killed about 1,100 people. Hamas is regarded as a terrorist group by many Western governments. Our chief international correspondent, Lise Doucette, has been to meet Israelis and Palestinians to discuss the continuing impact of the war in Gaza. We're here in a small agricultural community in southern Israel where the butterflies are flitting in the flowers, but we can see the bombing too. Gaza is so close. The the plumes of black smoke are rising on the horizon. You can hear a warplane in the sky. And the boundary fence is almost within touching distance. And it was there in the early hours of Saturday, October the 7th, that this crisis began, when Hamas fighters breached that barrier and went on a rampage, including here. My name is Hila Fenlon from uh, an agricultural community on the border of Gaza called Nativ Asara. So we're inside. There's a security bunker now. You can hear the echo. It's a place supposed to keep people safe. safe. Uh, Yeah, and an elderly woman by the name of Havik, a 79-year-old woman, just she was just walking on the street when all the rockets started before, and she entered the security room just to be safe from the rockets, and the tourists spotted her and followed her inside, and they shot her nine times, and you can see it here behind us. Oh, you can see, yeah, the... the, She was just... pitted. She was just standing here. the poles... We were with my children and my partner's children locked for in a, in a shelter for 12 hours without electricity and no reception. And the terrorists were stopped in the evening uh, by soldiers that finally arrived. Uh, four of them were arrested uh, or stopped two houses down my house. So it's mean it would have been another 10 or 15 minutes before they would have been into my house as well. Gaza is so close. We can see it. The, the fence just runs so close to here. The war goes on on the other side. Do you follow what's happening there and the suffering of Gazan civilians? I feel sorry that we are in this situation. I feel sorry for them and I also feel sorry for us. We didn't ask for it. We didn't attack ourselves. We got attacked. We are living next to a terror organization that not only did what it did, also said it'll do it again. So we need to make sure it will not happen again. About 10 miles away, still so close to Gaza, aside from the occasional cry of a crow, there's silence and it's absolutely chilling. This was the site of the Nova Music Festival, where a place of celebration turned into scenes of absolute carnage. And now, everywhere you look, in the shade of these eucalyptus trees, there are the photographs, the banners of young, smiling Israelis. More than 370 were killed here by Hamas and other fighters. More than 40 taken across the wire into Gaza. And now it's a memorial to what happened that day.
Yeah, I'm tel- from Tel Aviv, and uh, you come here and see what's happened here. Something terrible. Look at this uh, picture. They are so young. Just came here to dance and enjoy their life, and then, uh, and that's all. My name is David. I feel very, very, very bad with the situation. I'm looking all the time for peace. And all the time we have the fight. I'm not believe anymore with the peace. Here at this main roundabout in Tel Aviv, people are gathered all around this fountain, sitting on the grass, on the park benches. The old rhythms of life seem to be slowly returning, but it's not the same. All around this fountain, there's not one space that's empty. Photographs of the hostages, teddy bears, candles, flowers, and so many more Israeli flags. So many Israelis tell us this is a different country now. How has your life changed since then? It's just changing my feelings. I feel it's like anxiety. It's not so easy for me to like go out, have drinks, just do the normal things. Because I constantly think about the situation and the people who still suffer. Would you like the war to end? Because Israelis yeah. suffered, now Gazans are suffering no, enormously. It's very painful for me that there is not enough stress here on what's happening on the other side. I think in the media. There's not enough, you know, exposure. And this is the main street in the main city, main Palestinian city in the occupied West Bank. Foreign journalists aren't allowed to go to Gaza to report there. So we've come here to get a sense of what Palestinians are saying and how their lives have changed by this war in Gaza, some 60 miles away. Can I ask your, your name? My name is Alex. Alex, how has the um, October 7th war in Gaza affected your own life here in Ramallah? It has some effect. We have just gotten used to so many deaths, so many wars over the years. You just eventually get numb to it. Like, every day I hear some people are dying, some people are dying. At first it used to get to me, but now it's just more like... It's something that I hear in passing, and that is honestly devastating when you have to think about it because... People dying every day in the hundreds, people starving to death. It's not something that you should be able to just ignore, but a lot of people here are just just simply capable of living with it as a fact because there is just nothing we can actually do about it. Do you think this war will make it harder to achieve peace between Israelis and Palestinians? I don't think it's the war mostly that's going to be affecting the peace process. It's mostly the worldviews and the views of the Jewish people and the Israelis. Uh, the way that people are now considered anti-Semitic for opposing Israel when they're opposing the genocide, not the religion itself. But it is a political ploy by the Israeli people. Did you have any sympathy for Israel when, during the October 7th attack? I've had some sympathies for the civilians, but not really for the military. Let me put your name. Diala, I'm 21. Do you think after what's happened that it's still possible for Israelis and Palestinians to end these wars, achieve peace? I don't think so. I think everyone sees from their own point of view and they will never see from the other side. I mean, even to just settle it, it's not even possible, I don't think. There's always going to be war, there's always going to be someone fighting for their own land, I guess, if if they think it is, you know? What could change it? I think when other people around the world join in and really see that what's going on is wrong, that it's um, it's genocide, and that's the only way that it can actually change anything. Of course, Israel denies that of it's course. genocide. Yeah, and the rest of the world does because uh, they only see what the news allows them to see. That report by Lise Doucette, our chief international correspondent. The head of NATO says Western governments are facing an authoritarian alliance comprised of Russia, China, Iran and North Korea, which is working ever more closely together. Jens Stoltenberg also said North Korea was sending enormous amounts of ammunition in support of President Vladimir Putin's war against Ukraine. Mr Stoltenberg went on to say that NATO and other Western countries must be resolute. China, uh, Russia, North Korea, Iran, they are more and more aligned. They support each other more and more, uh, also in very practical ways. And that makes it even more important than like-minded countries, NATO allies, but also our partners in the Asia-Pacific, that we also work more closely together. And that's exactly what we do to stand up against this alliance of authoritarian powers. Grant Ferret has more details on the significance of Mr Stoltenberg's comments. 
At the end of a week in which NATO marked its 75th anniversary, Jens Stoltenberg outlined the challenge it now faced. He said President Vladimir Putin's government, along with Beijing, Tehran and Pyongyang, were working ever more closely, sharing technology and military equipment. Mr Stoltenberg said China was propping up what he called Russia's war economy, with North Korea sending enormous amounts of ammunition and Iran supplying drones. He said NATO's response was not only to strengthen the alliance, but to work with partners outside its traditional scope, including Japan, South Korea, Australia and New Zealand. Grant Ferret. Tens of thousands of people have taken part in a big anti-government rally in the Hungarian capital, Budapest. The demonstration was held by Peter Magyar, who has emerged as a challenger to the Prime Minister, Viktor Orban. From Budapest, Nick Thorpe reports. In warm spring weather, supporters of Peter Magyar's Stand Up Hungarians movement marched on Parliament. They include both disillusioned former Fidesz voters and disappointed supporters of the six main opposition parties. The latest opinion poll suggests that Peter Magyar's new party, even before it's founded, is already the third force in Hungarian politics. The challenge now for Peter Magyar and his rapidly expanding movement is to channel widespread anger with corruption and the centralisation of power under Viktor Orban into a party which could threaten Fidesz in the next elections. Nick Thorpe. Now to Slovakia, which has been holding a presidential election runoff that could be described as a contest between those who support the West and those who favour the Kremlin. The two candidates for the largely ceremonial but influential post are the pro-Western former diplomat Ivan Korchok and Petr Pellegrini, the candidate of the populist nationalist government. Our correspondent Rob Cameron told me what happened. Well, the latest is that uh, Petr Pellegrini has very much uh, been elected the next president of Slovakia. Uh, we haven't got all the results in yet, but it now seems clear with about 90-95% um, of constituencies returning their ballots, combined with these uh, mathematical uh, modellings that uh, news servers do these days, it's now quite clear that Petr Pellegrini has been elected as the new president of Slovakia to replace the liberal president Zuzana Chaputova, who's decided not to seek re-election after receiving what she says was a torrent of abuse and death threats, including from uh, some of the uh, supporters of, of, of the government of which Mr Pellegrini is a part. Um, so a sense, really, of the atmosphere in Slovak politics and society at the moment. Now, I said this is largely ceremonial position, but it's influential in what way? It's very influential. Uh, one chief reason, I think, is that uh, Slovakia, unlike other countries in the region, such as the Czech Republic, Slovakia only has one house of parliament. Um, so the president uh, plays a, a really an outsized role. And we saw that actually with President Chaputova, who is very much um, in opposition to some of the things that the populist nationalist government of Robert Fico is uh, trying to push through in Slovakia. He's really taken a you know, wrecking ball to Slovakia's criminal justice system and now has his sights set on the um, public broadcaster. But she actually succeeded in blocking some of those changes to the penal code by sending them to the constitutional court and only she has the right to do that. So Mr Fizzo has been blocked to a degree in his ambitions to change the criminal justice system in Slovakia. And the big worry is that Petr Pellegrini who is an ally of Robert Fico um, and is in, you know, one of, he leads one of the parties in his government, that he won't play that blocking role. He won't be that bulwark against Mr Fico's attempts to create what his critics say is a vision of, a, of an illiberal democracy in Slovakia, perhaps along the lines inspired by Viktor Orban's Hungary. Rob Cameron. There are some events which seem to happen without much warning and then there are solar eclipses. The one due to take place on Monday was actually predicted more than 100 years ago. And yet people are apparently still trying to work out how they'll get to one of the spots in the US, Mexico and Canada where they'll be able to see it, not to mention where they'll stay once they arrive. Many are expected to head to New York State, where officials like Jessica DeSess has spent the past year preparing for this influx. We are so excited for New York State to be in the path 
you know, this is the first time in 99 years, and it's going to be the last time for the next one, I think, that will be viewable in New York State is 2079. So this is a once in a lifetime experience. It's hard to predict how many people are going to be here. But anecdotally, we've heard from all of the hotels are booked, all of the Airbnbs are booked. And it was amazing to me once I started researching that people come from all over the world to view these. I've seen descriptions of people describing this as a very spiritual experience. The traffic is is a main concern. There were some states uh, that experienced a total solar eclipse in 2017, and, and there was a lot of traffic overload. So even though they and we have been telling people to come for the eclipse, but stay here for a couple of days and experience our great New York state, people tended to get on the road right after. And that caused a lot of backups. The other thing is that we don't, and we've been messaging this really, really a lot, uh, don't pull over on the side of the road to watch this eclipse. That's dangerous. So we want everyone to follow all the traffic laws and rules to make sure that we don't end up with pileups on the roadways. Jessica de Sitz. Still to come. The first wolf was spotted in Switzerland in 2012. There are now believed to be more than 300 roaming the Alpine nation as part of 32 packs. Now, in a sign of protest, Swiss farmers have dumped the bodies of a dozen sheep killed by the predators in front of a government building in Lausanne. The information spaces we inhabit can resemble a hall of mirrors. It's called guided democracy or managed democracy. There are different parties, different candidates, but everyone knows who is going to win. The Global Jigsaw is the podcast helping you make sense of them. We've seen a crackdown on the opposition. We've seen an increase in censorship. That's The Global Jigsaw from the BBC World Service. Listen now by searching for The Explanation wherever you get your BBC podcasts. Welcome back to the Global News Podcast. Now to Ecuador. And a huge row is developing in Latin America over the storming of the Mexican embassy in Quito. That's the capital of Ecuador. Armed police searched the complex and seized the former vice president of Ecuador, who's been sheltering there since December. It's virtually unheard of to enter the diplomatic mission of another country, which is considered to be sovereign territory. Both Mexico and Nicaragua have severed diplomatic ties with Ecuador. The Mexican foreign minister is Alicia Barcena. Mexico announces the immediate suspension of diplomatic relations with Ecuador. In this sense, our diplomatic personnel in Ecuador will leave the country immediately. We urge Ecuador to offer the necessary guarantees for the departing personnel. Mexico will appeal to the International Court of Justice to hold Ecuador accountable for violations of international law. Other Latin American countries like Brazil, Colombia and Argentina have condemned the raid. I spoke to our Latin America regional editor, Leonardo Rocha, who's in Miami. So what's behind this row? Why did Ecuador invade Mexico's embassy? And why was the former vice president there? What I find interesting is that before this uh, uh, operation, the Mexican president had said that he wouldn't uh, basically break relations with Ecuador. The the relations were damaged for for a while, but he was trying to to keep it going. So no one really expected them to enter the embassy. What happened is in December, Jorge Glass entered the embassy. He'd served a sentence for corruption, which he denies. He said the allegations are political. He'd served four years. And then in December, a court ordered him to go back to jail and when he heard that he went into the embassy, the Mexican embassy you have a centre-right government now in Ecuador and you have a sort of centre-left government in in Mexico and Jorge Glass is basically, he was the vice president of Rafael Correa he's a a very strong, powerful force, the main force of the left wing in Ecuador, he's also in exile so he had this whole thing, division between left and right accusations of corruption and uh, he ended to the embassy and thought he was safe there. But uh, basically, uh, Ecuador, the, the government of uh, President Noboa, wasn't allowing him to go until this operation uh, happened. It took everyone by surprise. Interesting. So it would seem sensible for, for this vice 
president to, to go into the Mexican embassy. It's a left wing um, government in Mexico at the moment. So they assumed they were safe there. That is not the case. This has now caused a huge row across Latin America, hasn't it? Do you think is it, is it uh, over the principle of the sovereignty of an embassy, do you think? I think so, because uh, as you mentioned before, you had uh, Venezuela, Colombia, the the left-wing governments in the region, Brazil, Nicaragua, they were very quick to condemn what happened there. But then Argentina with Javier Milei, who is a very close uh, ally of of, uh, the Ecuadorian government, he uh, described himself as a libertarian and anti-communist. He also issued a a statement saying it violates the principle of uh, diplomacy. Also, if, if a country decides to give political asylum to another country, you're expected to respect that, or at least not to storm the embassy. I think Latin American politics is going to through a stage where people are saying things that they shouldn't be saying. Presidents are calling names and, and it's going to a very dangerous path because of this left and, and right division across the continent. Leonardo Russia. Is the military junta in Myanmar losing its grip on power? It deposed the democratically elected government three years ago, and since then a number of armed groups have tried to fight back. It's been an uphill struggle. They've been hugely outnumbered and outgunned. But now Myanmar's military government is coming under serious pressure from opposition forces. They've lost control along parts of the border with India and China, and now the busiest border crossing into Thailand, through which much of Myanmar's trade passes. I heard more from our correspondent in the region, Jonathan Head. Well, it looks pretty clear now that the military junta has lost complete control of what is probably the most important border crossing, well, one of the, one of the two, the other one's up in China, for Myanmar. I mean, a huge amount of Myanmar's trade goes through this border town, Myawadi. In fact, much more than you'd expect because uh, Myanmar has very poor port facilities, so a great many manufacturers there and traders go through Miawadi into Thailand and trade out that way. This town has not been in insurgent control for many decades and now they've got it. I mean, they're negotiating, as we understand it, the surrender of the last military battalion that's based there, but the battalion commanders have said they want to surrender. It's just about terms. And they've already accepted the surrender of hundreds more, more than 600 soldiers on Friday at a town nearby. It was a very big military post and captured a great deal of military equipment with it, which I'm sure they'll find very useful. So it's a serious blow. And this is a military regime that has already lost significant swathes of territory up north on its border with China in the last few months and to the west on its border with Bangladesh. These are very significant losses Um, It's not something that the Myanmar military has ever experienced before. So given this is not a one-off, if you like, and it's significant in terms of trade, is it a a sign that the junta is losing control of larger and larger areas? It is, but it will take a long time, I imagine, for there to be a real swing against them, a real shift in the power balance. I mean, they still control the big cities, Yangon, Mandalay, and the capital, Nipidor, which is more or less a military fortress, although we did see that being attacked by drones flew in by the opposition early this week. So they're vulnerable even there. Everyone's calculating at the moment, you know, these blows are unprecedented for the Myanmar military. They're not able to rally enough troops to fight back. They're struggling with recruitment. They've now enforced conscription. That's causing lots of young people to flee. It does look like a regime that is unravelling, but I think realistically the military leaders know that they're loathed by the rest of the country. They've got nowhere else to go. They won't give up easily, so it's going to be a very long haul to overturn the military regime in Nepidor. But these kinds of losses...